My name is Yang Yang Cheng. I am a postdoctoral research associate at Cornell University. I'm a particle physicist by training and trade. I also write in the monthly Science and China column for SubChina and other publications. So this is a broad question. Um, I'll try to answer it in these three aspects. The first is um, the most obvious thing that when people think about um, techno-nationalism or technology-assisted state control, we think about facial voice-based recognition, we think about mass surveillance, biometric tracking, etc. And China is certainly putting efforts, a lot of investment into these tools and using them for state control. And I should add a note to that. A lot of these technology are new and they have problems. They are, um, a lot of times they are not as dystopian as what is presented as. However, the very fear factor of it is also a tool of state control. So even if the ca surveillance camera is there and even if it doesn't work particularly well or even if the data is not being processed, it still has this kind of intimidating factor on the population. The second aspect is in terms of the overall um, like what is phrase called like wealth and power. So with advances in science and technology, they contribute to the strength of a nation. And China, the China or Chinese government does see science as a tool of national greatness. And in terms of boosting, it's just not just military power or internal tools of internal oppression, but just its overall economic size that also contributes to the strength of the Chinese government because that's how the Chinese government derives its legitimacy. And I think to the third um, aspect, I would uh, talk about how, because science and especially science in China throughout history and especially now is primarily government funded in China uh, and in other parts of the world as well, but it differs a bit. And so scientists and technology workers, including technology firms, a lot of them rely on government subsidy. So in that aspect, um, the scientists and the technology workers who rely on state funding and state support to do their work, that is also a way for the state to co-opt science. So I think actually on a fundamental level, this really is not exclusive to Chinese scientists, non-Chinese scientists, regardless of their national origin or the national affiliation of the institution they work with, is the scientific community in general needs to have a kind of reckoning of what is the ethical and moral responsibilities in their work, what is their potential complicity in terms of receiving state funding and other sources of funding. China is on another degree of, of scale and complexity with regards to this. And so I think the first step is really to have this kind of awareness that is not directed at any individual uh, country, government or entity, but, but to have this kind of reflection. And I think on the second part is more specifically, I think because a lot of uh, non-Chinese scientists, they do work with Chinese institutions, they have collaborations, and on specific cases, I do hope that they can use their professional ties and their personal privilege that is derived from their professional prestige to push individual institutions. I'll give you this one example. For example, last year, Peking University and a few other prestigious Chinese universities had this arrest and harassment of Marxist uh, student labor, or, uh, labor activists and organizers. And at the same time, I have some colleagues who were actually um, having a, a, a workshop at Peking University at the time. And I felt it was a not passing moral judgment on any of my colleagues, but I wished that they, they could have used that opportunity to at least make, state, make a statement and put some kind of pressure. And of course, the outcome is unpredictable because it depends on the Chinese side. But I think that kind of, even a gesture of solidarity is, would be meaningful when it is so rare. This is difficult, right? Because I don't want to sound as if I'm passing moral judgment. I think for my most recent column, I think I, I wrote about this with this Pakistani 
physicist Abdul Salam, who was the first Muslim scientist to receive the Nobel Prize, but he was actually abandoned by the Pakistani government because he was of the a Muslim minority Ahmadi sect, which the Pakistani government doesn't recognize as Muslim, and there is a lot of sectarian violence against it. And even in that context, Abdul Salam still um, always sought opportunities to work with the Pakistani government to help build Pakistan scientific infrastructure, including he was involved in the earlier, day, earlier days and years of, in the Pakistani nuclear program, which was more controversial. And, and I find it to be such an interesting example because, um, and I think about my Chinese colleagues or my, uh, my, my professors or my professor's professors who are aware and many of them were persecuted in earlier generation by the Chinese government, but they still had this devotion to their country and their people, and they made these moral and ethical negotiations on their own and decided that it was worth it. And I think this is only um, a decision to be made on an individual level. What I do think is important is finding a justification is not absolute, uh, doesn't absolve one of one's complicity. We also have examples of like former Soviet scientists or like North South Korean scientists when South Korea was still a military dictatorship. So uh, there was one particular South Korean particle physicist who was working in the US and refused to work on the textbook for the South Korean government when it was a military dictatorship as his form of protest. Again, I'm not advocating that everyone should follow his example, but I think it's, it's an individual decision. But I still think the first step is comes with this kind of awareness that one cannot say because what I'm doing helps the people so that I am I'm not uh, complicit in the Chinese government's actions and even including its crimes. I think how I grapple with my identity as a Chinese scientist and as a woman working in the US First is the, the end of my pursuit, right? I'm, I'm an experimental particle physicist. I work in literally the most fundamental branch of science. And my profession, my, my intellectual physics has been the one thing that grounds me, that gives me joy and clarity like nothing else. And that is one part of it. And being a physicist is such a fundamental part of my identity. Uh, regardless of how my professional career might progress into the next stage. The second part, I think you're um, probably asking a bit more about being a part of the minority in my field. And I've been saying that uh, since I started writing, I've, been, I've known more Chinese women than I have ever since age 13 because I was in the science experimental program from high school. And, and I've experienced this extreme gender disparity in China and then in the US compounded with both gender and ethnicity and then also as an immigrant. I think it makes me more aware of the structural biases and structural injustices, not just in the scientific community, not just in academia, but also in society as a whole. And I do think a lot of these imbalances had negatively affected science in terms of how it is developed and how it is utilized. And some of these um, have caused rather severe consequences. Uh, for example, the one-child policy in China was um, thought up by missile scientists uh, in the 1980s who were almost exclusively all men and, and didn't understand this. And then in the US, we have um, issues with, for example, genetics and biomedicine that is being severely impacted both in terms of uh, women's um, health issues and also towards like uh, racial issues. So I think being a Chinese woman scientist working in the US is a constant examination of my vulnerabilities and my privileges. And my life has always been this kind of like a fault, a fault, a fault line that I both see the cosmopolitan ideal of science of my profession, but I also see how it's, its limitations in practice. And, and I do think both make me a better scientist, and especially in the latter, it also gives me a kind of mission and responsibility 
that I am in physics, not only to advance human understanding of nature, but also to make the academy a more inclusive and equitable space. I think uh, when, when the field is dominated by men, even without malicious intent, just by a complete lack of awareness, it creates a lot of uh, problems for, uh, for women throughout the pipeline. And, and I've been very open in, in talking about this, that my own scientific career uh, was not encouraged uh, by my family, and especially by my mother, because I was raised by a single mom. And she, on one hand, being a very ambitious woman, on the other hand, still internalized these gender-based biases. And throughout my uh, PhD in the US, she had waited for me to drop out someday and go back to China be a high school English teacher, which is a perfectly honorable profession. It's just one I don't have any interest in. And I feel if I were a boy, he, she wouldn't have been making this decision, uh, this suggestion the entire time. I've spoken on about this or written a bit about this publicly, that there are issues that I, I experience personally and I witness in terms of um, sexual harassment or even assault. In, in academia and as well as in society in general. And in terms of um, rectifying this, I think the first step is still to realize this is a problem. Just because this problem has existed for a long time, like we cannot just put out a, a Marie Curie. So there are a few examples of women who had succeeded and so the rest, they should just tough it out. I think we live in a society in some way that try to glorify suffering as a way to normalize and justify injustice and that is wrong and i have experienced things which is not a badge of honor but because i have experienced them and survived it is part of my responsibility but also the responsibility of the entire community to make sure that this doesn't happen again and and so i think this is this is important and it cannot be limited to just a university, not just to academia, not just to the education system, but really society as a whole.